Welcome back to the new show, and this week, a middling week in terms of quantity, but you know, you can't have it all the time. Hello, welcome back, and just a quick thing before I start, next week there will be no news because I am away. However, I'm still hopefully trying to do the E3 stream with some friends, so more details on that as soon as I know what's going on, but we'll see. And I think that's it news-wise, yeah, content stay much the same, like, apart from that, so all good. Moving on. The Need for Speed franchise is getting another game, because of course it is, scheduled for release in, I think it's October this year? Oh, sorry, no. November this year, November the 10th this year. It is a sequel to the sort of reboot of the Need for Speed franchise that was received middlingly last year or the year before. And this time it seems to be very much in the vein of Need for Speed Carbon and Need for Speed Underground 2, though most wanted in those kind of veins, because it's called Need for Speed Payback and you are sort of, it's going along that sort of line with a lovely single player. Hooray! Hooray, a single player. Just what we wanted. Good. Again, I will always state this should not be a praiseworthy move, but from EA it is becoming that, which is kind of sad when you think about it. The game has a trailer, which I'm probably putting up on the screen, and I don't know, looks fine. It looks like a Need for Speed game, and it's, it looks interesting enough, I suppose. You can sort of bet money on the races, but you know, I don't know, whatever, it's there, I suppose, if that's the thing you're into. The Need for Speed franchise kind of lost my interest after Need for Speed Carbon, because they sort of turned away from the interesting single player and just went for the races, and the open world of like Underground 2 and Most Wanted and Carbon, those are the three pinnacles of that series in my mind. Um, they, they were just sort of abandoned, and I don't really like the way they did that, but we'll see, we'll see, this might be very good. Quick bit of Pokemon Go news, and they are finally adding PvP elements into it, the thing that everyone's wanted since the start, and about, what is it, is it a year and a half, two years, I don't even know, ages after it launched, it's, yeah, it's getting some PvP elements. In the summer, not, not just yet, it's launching in the Northern Hemisphere, quote, this summer, uh, along with the legendary Pokemon that were conspicuously missing from the original sort of release of the game. It had all of them apart from the legendaries, but they're finally coming in and that's all we know. There's no sort of other information other than these things are arriving. They might be really shit for all we know, but they are indeed arriving. So that's just a quick bit of Pokemon Go news. There is another bit of Nintendo news now. Who remembers the way the Switch's online services were going to work initially? Very poorly, if I remember rightly and they were supposed to be on a sort of model where you pay monthly and you get access to a single game per month. That's a terrible deal, I really don't like that deal. Now this service has been pushed back to next year. All the online stuff is going to remain free until next year when they are going to implement this a similar model to the one that they announced but they have changed it slightly. Instead of having access to a single game per month and then you don't get access to it unless you purchase it, you now get access to a full library of quote classic Nintendo games with added online functionality. Now as someone who thinks Nintendo should just release their whole back catalogue onto their consoles constantly because their back catalogue is full of very good games and a lot of dross and there's a lot of games I'd like to pick up but I can't pick up for very cheap at all. Paper Mario. Thousand year door. This service is very welcome to me and I really hope that something good comes of it because, you know, as long as the games themselves are good then this service actually sounds like a very good idea. You're paying £10 a month, but you get access to so many games for free. If they're good games, that's going to be a really killer deal and we'll get a lot of people on board, I think. And now to a delay. Uh, Middle Earth, Middle Earth, Middle Earth, that's the one. Shadow of War, the sequel to the rather well-received Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor, is being delayed. 
It's only been delayed by about two months. It's been delayed from August release until an October release. And I'm for this. I'm for most sort of delays like this because they stated, and I fully believe them in almost all of the cases where this happens, that they're just trying to make the game as higher quality as they possibly can. And there is no universe in which that is a bad thing. We want our games to be the highest possible quality we can ever have them. And if I can get a game delayed by a couple of months just to have that bit of extra polish put onto it and make it the best product it could possibly be, all the better. In fact, to be honest, there's a lot of games I would rather have stayed on the developing board for another few months or even permanently because some of those things are not good. And I'm not going to go into names because I'm not going to be like the petty guy. I'm just a bit bitter, that's all. Batman Arkham Knight. So do you remember last uh, week I talked about Kerbal Space Program and the fact that... Uh, have I actually talked about this? I talked about the fact that some, some of the ex-Kerbal Space Program developers have been moved to Valve for an unspecified game. Now, more Kerbal Space Program news. The actual game, I think it's the game and not the company. Yes. It looks to be the game has been bought by Take-Two, the parent company of Rockstar. The team who originally made the game have stated that they are still fully behind it and will continue to support the game, but it's now got some people behind it. Some proper, really AAA money behind it, and hopefully that might make it really a lot better in the future. They've got the physics down, but they could maybe just have a bit of polish on the visuals or something like that and this could make a very good game even better. I really hope they don't ruin it because that would be a shame because Kerbal Space Program is amazing. I did a video on it, you should watch that. That, that was pretty fun. So yeah, I mean, I can't see this as anything other than a good thing yet. Microphone poking in, hello. This might go amazing, I really hope it does. And um, I say that with a lot of things. I have a very sort of, hopeful attitude but at the same time a bit pessimistic. I really want this to go well because Kerbal Space Program is amazing and I hope that Take-Two don't just sort of fuck it over. The PlayStation 3, the last generation PlayStation console, is finally out of production. It, it was in production until very recently apparently. I did not know this. The 500 gigabyte slim model was still being made brand new until just this week. And now it is finally gone out of production after about 10 years. That's very close to the 12 years that the PlayStation 2 was in production, but that's a pretty good record. The unit sold about 80 million units. The unit sold 80 million units. That's good. That's Donald Trump style words, that is. The best words. The console sold 80 million units over its lifespan, which is pretty damn impressive, although the PlayStation 4, which is only three years into its lifespan, is set to surpass that having sold 50 million units already at the time of speaking and there's hopefully still a lot more life left in the PlayStation 4 and its future variants. Having to speed up now because my battery is running rather low, Sonic Mania, the sort of the new, it's not a sequel or anything, it's just a new Sonic game and it is exactly like the old Sonic games but with a couple of little extra bits which makes it amazing, is getting a release date of August. No specific date date, but we have August, and a new trailer accompanied it, which I'm putting up, and oh my lord, does it look amazing. Basically this game looks like what we thought Sonic would end up being. It looks like just a very polished, slightly modernised version of the original three Sonic games. Like a little bit of zhuzh, a little bit of modern panache on the animations and all those kinds of things, and wow, they really have if it comes out the way it looks and it plays like the original games, it's going to be spectacular. Like, I really hope they don't fuck this up because we really need a good Sonic game. The character roster has been stripped back to just three characters, Sonic, Tails and Knuckles, the only three characters that are any good. The rest of them are just faff, no matter how much you might like them. I'm looking forward to this game. I am incredibly excited. I really hope it goes well because Sonic Let's be honest, it hasn't been good for a while. It's had the odd little glimmer of hope, but this return to 2D might just be what the Sonic franchise needs. 
Square Enix, the lovely company who decided to sell off IO Interactive, have decided that they are going to... Well, I say they're going to. They're willing to sell off the Hitman IP to keep the franchise running. Thank you, Square Enix, for this move. I mean, I'd rather you just not have sold IO Interactive, but I'm glad you're willing to sell the Hitman name, at least just so that the franchise doesn't die. That would be nothing if not a shame, because the Hitman franchise is almost perennial in the gaming world now. It's very embedded in gaming culture, and to see it die like this would be a tragedy. So I really hope that they're willing, they're willing to sell it off, and I really hope someone snaps it up and makes an amazing Hitman game with it. On the same subject though, um, Hitman is getting new content. The 2016 Hitman is getting new content despite all the stuff that's going on around it. The content is set to contain two uh, sort of assassination contract missions, a thing called the... what is it? Where is it? Who is it? The Isa Attunement in Bangkok. So, and... yeah. So, yeah, two contracts and that thing there, I think. Whatever. And the final bit of news I have very mixed feelings on. Steam Direct. Steam Direct is a thing that I covered a while ago, and it has very good potential to be a thing to clean Steam of the dross that's been getting on it. And the sort of crux of it lied on the amount of money that they wanted to charge developers per game to get it published on Steam. At the time of Steam Direct's announcement, they were thinking somewhere between the ranges of $200 to $5,000. Having apparently discussed this with the community, they have now settled on a figure of $100. So basically, to be able to get any game on Steam, all you have to do, you don't have to get it through Greenlight, you don't have to get it, like, you don't have to be a AAA publisher, you don't have to do anything like that. You just have to pay $100. No matter how shit your game is, no matter how much it doesn't work, all you have to do is pay $100 and that game can go on Steam provided it starts. Because that is the amount of moderation that Valve themselves will be putting into things. Valve is of course using its typical line that one man's trash is another man's treasure as their excuse to not be policing their own systems. However, I still don't buy that because if a game, while it starts up, doesn't work or just, you know, something can play objectively awfully. A lot of stuff does. Just go to Jim Sterling's YouTube channel and look at almost any of his videos and you'll see how much shit there is on Steam and how much doesn't play well and how could anyone enjoy half of the stuff that he puts out on there. So, I don't understand where Valve are coming from with this. This might work, this might be just the kind of thing that'll get the people, the touting bastards, off Steam. But I really doubt it if the price point is that low. I do also see the other half of the argument where they're going, well, we can now, we're open enough that small indie devs can still get their games on Steam, like the good ones. Um, the problem is, there's a lot more crap than there is good, and the best way to see the good things is to just review them. Say, this is how I do it, I'm really bearing in mind my time. If it were me running it, I would take their hundred dollars that they're paying to put this game on Steam, put it in an escrow. Then, I would hire somebody to play that game for a length of time, say two hours to the refund time, or maybe a little bit further. Then they could assess whether or not that game is worthy enough to be on Steam. Because I think if a game isn't good enough by two hours, it's not going to get much better. There's very few instances where it does get better after two hours. Because you should know everything about the game. Like you should know the basic mechanics and how things work. That's how I would do it. I might be wrong. If you've got any other suggestions, please feel free to leave a comment. But that's how I would do it. And I'm really running out of time, so I'm going to wrap up. So that was the news for this week. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, uh, the next news will be back in two weeks after my holiday. And if you like any gaming content, I am doing a series on... Oh, I'm not doing a series. I've just finished a series at the moment on FTL, which you can watch here. And my Let's Play this week was on a game called... Shit, what was it called? It was on the Gwent beta. How did I forget that? 
It was on the beta for Gwent, which you can watch here, and of course you can subscribe here. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time for more news.